Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now I'm delighted this week to be joined by the journalist Alex Kashuta. She is in Romania. She is a cultural critic and journalist. She's written for the New York Post. Uh, amongst many others, and she's also the host of a podcast called Subversive, a podcast for the outcast. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Alex. Um, thank you very much for having me on. No, it's a pleasure. I wonder, are you an outcast, and if so, why? Am I an outcast? Um, in in many ways, no. I'm I'm, I'm not an outcast. I haven't been uh, tarred and feathered by the you know my immediate community in any way. But uh, uh, in in some ways, I am I am a dissident. You know, I'm a I'm a, um, a young. I would say probably very right wing compared to the uh, to the to the median uh, woman in, in either the West or East. Uh, I'm, I'm Romanian originally. I live in Romania now. So um, essentially, what I was trying to do with the with the podcast is uh, is you know bring together a few a few of these dissident voices that I was uh, was talking with uh, in the fringes, um, and yeah, kind of open up the open up the conversation a little bit on on some topics that I think uh, don't get enough uh, airtime. Absolutely. I mean, I, I thought one of the reasons I'm speaking to you today, and I'm very pleased, is that I was very struck by. Your two of your most recent articles, beautifully written, I might add, um, and uh, which was about um, how one would bring up a young son, for example, in in our current age, and also, for that matter, something which and I'd like to start with this, if possible, that is almost never discussed, and that is the extraordinary free fall in population in the developed countries. Um, this was something you wrote about, I think, last month. Um, this is right, you actually mentioned some statistics there, first of all, Alex. I wonder whether you could refresh us with those. I mean, what actually are we talking about here in terms of, of percentages and numbers? Let me let me pull them up. Right? I don't have them off the top of my head. They're they're quite uh, they're quite shocking, uh, but it's, uh, it's it's good to to have them in front of me. Um, I think actually that the um, uh, if I can help you out there, uh, from what I can remember, um, in some cases, you know, uh, place Spain and Japan, I think, and Italy, you're talking about populations halving by the end of this century. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Italy will see its population go from 61 million to 28 million. So 28. even more, more than that. Really? Yes. Yeah, that's a projection. Um, I think what, what I was trying to, to uncover in this piece would be uh, you know, multiple perspectives on, on why that might be the case. Yes. Um, I think, um, you know, there, there are many, many people trying to diagnose this problem. Um, my final conclusion was that it's it's probably very multifaceted and it's tied into the complexity of, of living in the 21st century and living especially in developed countries. Um, but in the end, I think it's it's more of a, uh, besides it being a bit of a spiritual malaise, you know, there's not really um, a feeling that there, there is any reason to have children uh, anymore. Um, it's also an uncoupling from, um, from, you know, between stimulus and response. We have a lot of ways to, uh, to satisfy our, our most, uh, basic urges, but they're not the same as, uh, as back in the day. So essentially now, for example, you know, internet pornography does a lot of the jobs that, uh, you know, the, the simple quests to, to copulate would do, uh, you know, in, in more ancestral times. So we have many layers of intermediating, um, you know, products and services that kind of satisfy our, our you know, the, the desires of the lizard brain. And the between, you know, uh, just existing and wanting to have children, there's just quite a few of these layers. And I think a, a lot of people just never, never make it to the other side and or don't think it's, it's, a, it's a useful, you know, way to spend their time. There's quite a lot of sacrifice in, in having children. And I'm not sure everyone's prepared to do that. Do you think, therefore, that means that the that, for want of a better expression, people in developed countries are more selfish now? 
Um, I think the 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 self conception that exists in, in developed countries is even, like almost at a fundamental philosophical level different between uh, what we call the developing and developed countries. Um, this is, you know, partly based on kind of the the idea of the the liberal self making self, this uh, this this rational agent that is constantly choosing, um, you know, the the best life and and constantly refining uh, his or her options in life. Um, it's also the market, which only the only intermediary uh, that the market sees is the individual. So it's you know it's constantly interacting with you at the level of okay, how can we satisfy your desires? Um, people are also very hard. It's hard for them to um, predict what they might want in the future. So the market typically uh, works at the level of uh, what do you want now? You know, what what you know, little instincts can we tickle in you? What's what's hyper palatable? What's you know, interesting to you in the moment? Um, and all of these work more on people in developed countries rather than in developing countries, where um, dependence on family structures is higher. Dependence maybe on on a metaphysical structure of the of the universe is higher. Um, all of these ties that you know the liberal man does not have anymore, um, because you know you don't really need your family anymore. You don't really need a, a metaphysical structure when everything's provided for you. Um, I feel like that's that that disconnect happens much more intensely in in um, developed countries, and in a way that's a positive, obviously, because it opens up options. It opens up a certain flavor of freedom for um, these the people in these countries. But it also destroys many other kind of intangible aspects that uh, might have value in themselves, but uh, are very hard to measure, you know, in in the in the one to one uh, relationship that we have with with the market and the state and everything here in the West. Uh, one point you made actually in one of your recent podcasts, or I think it was made by one of your guests, but it is sort of interesting here. Is that there is a divide though? Is that in developed countries, take America, for example, uh, people in what you might call the upper economic sphere, the, the upper economic uh, sections of society, they too still tend to get married and they still have children. It, it's basically the, the further down the economic scale you go, this is where things have dissipated. It, does that, is that a familiar analysis to you? Yes, absolutely. I think this ties into into the concept of uh, of, of luxury beliefs as well. Um, the luxury idea beliefs. that you know, sorry, the... luxury beliefs. That's a that's a yes, great. I think... What it, how do you how would you sum up luxury beliefs? <laughs> um, beliefs that are professed by the upper classes with little to no consequence to them because right. their their actual lived experience is quite different or they're insulated by their wealth or prestige from the consequences of acting on these beliefs right um and that uh, affect the, the the lower classes in a, in a you know disproportionate way because they don't have these protections mm. uh, or they um you know they 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 don't have a fallback you know like for example if someone wants to um you know try to live a drug fueled polyamorous existence in their 20s but they are the son of a of, of i don't know a lord or someone who's got a lot of insulation uh, both social and uh, financial uh, then the the consequences in their 30s and 40s won't be as as intense as someone who you know goes on that path if they're you know if they're a 20 year old and says okay this is my life now there's 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 no coming back from many of these uh, these things and they do tend to end up as social dysfunctions at the bottom um, but they seem they seem like uh, interesting things to to profess at the top with with little consequence uh, this isn't this isn't my concept I think. Um, I think it was Rob Henderson who who promoted this uh, this idea, and I think yes. it's uh, it's quite it's quite a useful lens on on current situations. But I think it uh, it it seems to be all of a piece with a general trend in society, whereby um, I think it's even Robert Pullman has written about this that people in what you call upper class economic um, sections of society. Uh, they, they tend to intermarry. I mean, even from the point of view of, you know, meritocracies, if you like, they, they kind of intermarry. So if anything, there, there is less movement as well between them and uh, people beneath them 
in a way that there might have been more in the past, strangely enough, when it was all about social class. Exactly. And um, I think, you know, immigration is a layer on top of this as well, yeah. because, you know, what what, you know, relatively porous or open borders do, like, for example, in the European Union is, you know, there is there's a certain strip mining of, of cognitive potential of human capital from this from the developing countries or from the lesser developed countries moving to, uh, you know, the, the great cities of Europe and, and a big concentration there. Um, and then you have what you mentioned as well, a sort of mating where, you know, people who are in the same, you know, either a social class or cognitive class tend to cluster together and uh, and then either for purposes of, uh, yeah, maybe they just like each other more, you know, they're in the same university or for the purposes of, um, you know, uh, legacy wealth, maintaining wealth in families and building wealth, then they, they marry, they stay married. You know, there's actually more to lose if you divorce and you have your, you're quite a wealthy individual. So, you know, there's there's more incentives to stay together um, for children as well. There's, you know, social pressures. So um, there, there are a lot of incentives pointing towards people in the in the upper strata, um, you know, leading leading much more conventional lives, you know, leading the the the, the much maligned lives of the, the 1950s patriarchs, <laughs> which yes. which they you know, on, on the front end, they despise and they, you know, they counsel other people against. But, um, you know, if you really look at life outcomes, that's that's how they live. I think it's, uh, again, just to pursue this point, just one, one more one more time. Uh, there's also a sort of feeling that um, if you are going to question and undermine institutions uh, in society, whether it's the academic world, whether it's the uh, the, the legal world, you know, and, and crime and punishment, that essentially, if you are from a more privileged background, you will again still have a cushion. And it's all the, the people basically from lower income groups simply do not have that. If you take away the legitimacy of, for example, law enforcement and things like that, they will be left with the consequences of that, won't they? Exactly. And I think that at a, at a very deep level, this is a this is a theft from from the the so-called lower class. So we can't I don't think it's even you know wise to call anyone lower class at the mm -hmm. moment, except for maybe certain demographics that are that are hated throughout. But, um, you know, most people are, you know, dis disadvantaged or un underprivileged or, you know, there's always a like kind of a contextual layer of, you know, why this is just, uh, you know, a stroke of luck. But uh, sometimes it's it's not just bad luck. It's it's, you know, lack of uh, lack of basic in life instructions like you probably need insurance you probably don't want to have children out of wedlock because you know things you know negative things happen maybe you have children you know when you're slightly more settled um there, there are different ingredients that you know back in the day used to be imposed by the the iron iron hand of the patriarch or whatever we want to call it but they they were just uh so that was the water we swam in. You know, there was a little, there was stigma associated with not following these paths. Um, there was, uh, there were, you know, old wives, you know, snickering in, in, in corner rooms about, you know, people who hadn't done this. So there, there were little mechanisms for enforcement. It, it wasn't all just, you know, being uh, exiled from from the village if you if you were uh, if you were being bad and, and going against the grain. Yeah. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this was. The, the way of the community to maintain an equilibrium, a positive equilibrium with pro-social goals. Yes. Um, you mentioned, you know, if you just go back a little bit uh, to the reasons for, for example, population uh, decline in the developed world. Uh, and you said, you know, there, there has just been this break between stimuli and procreation, actually, that essentially on almost all fronts has been a, a break which is relatively new in, in history. Um, but also you go into the whole dating thing. You, get, you, know, you, you look at internet dating, which is basically where all dating happens now. Um, how is it reflected? I mean, how, if we were to look at the way people now make relationships or try to, um, how, what can you see there as patterns that might also throw light on this? I mean, this is one of the things you wrote about. Yes, absolutely. I think um, 
you know, in the in the dawn of internet dating, it was expected that okay, this is the the new algorithmic dating. It will it will help you find the perfect mate for you, um, and it's it sounded really really great because you're okay. There's so many factors that you can now match with people on. You know, it's it's much more certain that you'll find someone that actually reflects your values. Uh, but what this ignored is that dating is basically competitive. Everyone wants the best mate. Everyone wants you know to to, to trade up as much as possible. Uh, and in terms of, of how women and men date, there are different strategies typically. Um, you know, obviously at the moment we're we're told that that men and women are basically interchangeable. They have the same urges and things like that. But I think on this show we can maybe skip over explaining why that is not the case. Uh, and. Uh, so <laughs> women will, will typically want, uh, you know, overall, obviously on average, will want uh, more commitment, more longer term relationships. You know, that would be the goal. Obviously, even if they if they have some more casual relationships in the end, typically they would want to need to settle down or have a longer term relationship. Men, on the other hand, will date much more freely and they will date all across the spectrum, you know, women that are within their socioeconomic stratum, women outside of that, you know, different different types of women. Um, and these two dating strategies, they clash while, when they're put together in these algorithms and they're all kind of united under the header of dating, but they, they're essentially two markets trying to uh, find equilibria that are different for, for each of these. So typically what happens in, a, in this algorithmic dating situation is that men that are at the top of the, the hierarchy, you know, say the five to 10 percent of top men in terms of, you know, how they look or how they can present themselves on these apps, yeah. you know, show their socioeconomic position, all sorts of all sorts of good qualities. They will date intensely because they have they don't they don't really have a cap on how much they can date and they might date a woman every night for a week or, you know, so they uh, essentially essentially they corner the market. And for women looking for a relationship, they're like, okay, I, I can go on a date with this guy. And then essentially the guy maybe dates you once or twice, but then this, this never never calls back. Yeah. And this is essentially a, a weird equilibrium in which maybe let's say 80% of the bottom men, they don't go on any dates at all. Or maybe I'm exaggerating, but a very, very large percentage of men don't go on any dates at all because the women tend to be pickier. They want to go dating with the, with the higher class men. And the higher class men as well, they don't mind having these dates with the women, but they won't commit. So essentially, uh, a, a lot of people are locked in these, um, you know, women trying to get a long term relationship, you know, men at, at the middle and bottom, not getting any opportunity to have a relationship. And then these kind of harems light for for guys that that are at the top of the hierarchy, uh, and that can you know the, all the cards are on their table, but there's not really any, any incentives for them to just to, to settle down in any any way. So um, this is a bad balance. This is a bad equilibrium, um, and it's it's something that's not very apparent from people that you know just look. Oh, it's a dating app. You know, obviously mm -hmm. find random people. But because of this competitive nature and because of how the strategies are different, um, it's it, it obviously what it does in terms of um, of procreation and why it, it stalls it is that women cannot get the long term relationships they want. The men at the top are not incentivized to settle down and the, the men at the bottom don't even get to play the game at all. So it's uh, no one's getting any any time to have children in this combination. But this is a kind of brutal, isn't it, Alex? I mean, it's it's it almost feel. I mean, but, but basically, it seems to me what what this means is is that the internet is just reflecting the most kind of traditional idea about what men and women want. You know that women want someone who's basically going to be a good father, a good provider, an alpha male. Call it what you want. And also the men, on the other hand, are sort of wanting to spread themselves as far as possible, you know, with little consequences. Is that is that correct, you think? Um, I think the the market provides and I think in, in, in subtle and in subtle ways, people will, you know, will react on their 
biological settings and on the incentives that are presented to them. Um, you know, you know, if, if you look at this from the perspective of a single individual in this system, uh, obviously you'd want to date the most interesting person that you can on that app. Uh, and if, if a very high status man wants to go out on a date with, with a woman, she, her incentives are to say, yes, of course, you know, let's go out there. Uh, but what she doesn't know is that, you know, what, what his, state of mind is mm. because he's, you know, he's spoiled for choice. Mm. Um, him being spoiled for choice, you know, that kind of sets up his incentives as well. Cause you know, even if he wants to have a long-term relationship, then, you know, he, he is, is incentivized to think about it and he's incentivized to really, you know, take his time, maybe pick out a, a woman that's ex extraordinary um, with time and with a lot of exposure to different women, it becomes very hard to make that choice because women are different. They all have, faults they all have you know interesting qualities none of them is going to be perfect so if you're just waiting for the perfect one then uh you might be waiting for a very long time um it's also you know for men the the, the prospects of uh you know of dating tend to increase with uh with socioeconomic status and with time men do acquire typically more resources you know a man at 38 or 40 is quite in, in his prime and he can you know maybe think about uh, you know, maybe playing around even more. So uh, the incentives kind of align for him as well to be continuing to stay on these apps and all of these little factors, uh, you know, come together and, and they result in this pretty hideous equilibrium for people trying to, you know, each, yeah. each of them is trying to make a good life for themselves, but <clears throat> overall it's, uh, it's not very good. And for the, for the guys at the bottom, yeah, there's not even there's no story to tell because no one no one no one swipes right there. It's it's quite a yes. yeah. It's 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 not it's not great. Do you think as well there's something in the view which is the bleak view, um, but it's one that seems obvious to me that in developed countries in the West, um, different countries that basically there's little sense anymore of a future, and um, in the sense that pe people don't talk about it they, they they don't it doesn't it's not in the air you know so therefore if that is the case then you, why would you have children because the whole point of children of course is the future it's it is basically making sure the species goes on um, and yet we don't appear anymore to to think very much about the future or consider it as being a desirable nice place to be Yes, I, I think that's that's probably uh, definitely part of part of the issue, because um, on the one hand, you have this, you know, very uh, direct individualistic, uh, you know, rational agent idea of, of what it is to be a human to, you know, to produce uh, and go up in, in status and then be a consumer of different high status goods. And, you know, you can fill a life with, with all this distraction. Um, then on the other hand, you also have the idea that belonging to a lineage, belonging to a culture is is pretty disgraceful. If you're not, you know, part of some exotic culture where that's still allowed, but if you're, for example, a, a British man, it's probably not a good idea to be making a big deal out of the fact that you, um, you, you know, you, you like Britain in the context that you've grew up in, uh, you you'd like to participate in creating a, your lineage to uh, you know promote your country within you know whatever parameters you think are useful for it. Uh, be be proud of, of of who you are, all of this stuff. So the, that's if, if you can't have a past, why would you want a future? There's there's not really that much to um, to live for, um, except for the, the moment to moment enjoyment. These things you mentioned there, I suppose, Alex, really are now are now considered low status things to have, aren't they? Uh, you know, like a belief in your locality, your nation, your family. Absolutely, um, these are uh, child things, if I remember correctly. Yeah, only only people who um, who are not enlightened enough to to realize that we're all a part of the global village. And that you know borders are, are a human invention. Um, yeah, those those people they get to to, to enjoy their their uh, lineage. What is it like therefore in Romania? Are we? Is it the same situation, um, or you know, or is it markedly different where you are? Um, I think 
Romania is, is kind of the, the quintessential country in, in transition. And where we're transitioning to is, you know, trying to be a worthy member of the of the kind of Western empire. And by this, I mean probably American influence. And, um, you know, I... It, it's, it's we're not there yet, but I think we're you know five five years down the line because this this is aspirational. The West is aspirational. Whatever comes down the pipe from the West, we'll we'll take it. Mm -hmm. You know, it might take a, a bit of time to for it to trickle down. And you know, now you know our elites, you know, the people who, are, who have studied abroad and, and worked abroad, they are very much you know uh, proud neoliberals. Um, but uh, you know the you know your average man uh, probably not yet. But yeah, as I said, it, it trickles down. These these beliefs really do trickle down. Is that something that you would both regret and resist, presumably? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely used to be uh, very much part of, of of that class. You know, looking to the West. You know, trying to integrate. I, I got a. Uh, degree in, in diversity management at a, at a fine Western university. So I, I, I know the, the lingo, I know exactly <laughs> what, what was expected of me. Um, yeah, af after a while, it, it became clear to me that, uh, that that wasn't a good direction to go. So I, I would personally resist it, but I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's a very mainstream view. You, uh, you were in London, were you not for a while, Alex? Yes, yes, I was, I was. Yeah, and, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of people listening to you uh, would think that you were born and bred uh, uh, American and now, Amer but not not at all. No, right? No, no, not at all. I uh, I just I watch so much television, and believe me, I tried to I tried to get a bit of a, a British accent or at least a British affectation when I was in the UK. It just doesn't stick after a <laughs> while. You know, when you're 25, it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> work anymore. No. Um, when you say it's sort of coming down the line, say to Romania, five years time, it's sort of already seen. This is something that I've heard from. We've had a guest on the show quite recently called Frank Ferradi, uh, who's Hung originally Hungarian. He sees the same thing happening in Hungary. Um, from w which channels is it coming? Is it via Netflix or is it the academic, academic ideas? How? Um, I think it's mostly via Netflix. I would say it's via Instagram. It's via because now you you have the so-called woke capital. Um, almost all uh, multinationals have to have a, a layer of social justice embedded somehow, uh, and they're promoting it in every way. I mean, I, I keep bringing up this example, but it was really funny to me because I, I went for coffee with a friend here, a, a childhood friend in Romania, and she was talking to me about abortion rights in Alabama, uh, and <laughs> it was quite, quite shocking. Like she, I, I would probably you know put good money on the fact that she didn't know the intricacies of local elections but she was very clued into into potential human rights abuses in in alabama and uh, yes. you know all the all the nuances of that debate and it, it was a bit interesting to me because this is i mean I, I live in a small town this is not bucharest you know this this is you know it's it's been trickling down very hard and yes. <laughs> it's yeah anyone who speaks english but gets gets the bug yes um Speaking of which, you, you, you mentioned the, the sort of empire, as you put it earlier, um, and you wrote a piece recently about, called Having Babies at the Twilight of Empire, which is, uh, I think, fascinating. And you, you mentioned uh, some, which, uh, now, uh, please, please do um, excuse my uh, ignorance of this. Have you had your child yet, or have you had your baby? It's Imminent. 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 <laughs> okay, well, all, all, yes. the very, all the very best. But you, you, you were talking about having a son during a period in which all the cultural dynamics are running against, well, sons, could you say? Yes, I think um, I think it's it's less so um, against the son if he chooses to be part of you know um, of of some some form of intersectional situation but if, if he chooses to be a a, uh, a masculine man then probably uh, he'd be, he'd be bearing the full brunt of uh, of uh, the opprobrium that we're uh, res reserving for for that um i i think the the the, the whole conversation on masculinity is, is is very skewed and the idea that you know 
only men can have uh, so-called toxic masculinity. Um, yeah, I think the, the, there, there are many layers to this, but I think it's, 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 quite, it's quite sick the way we've positioned it. And I was essentially, I was worrying in that piece, just thinking, hey, how could I, how, how could I as a woman, uh, you know, lay the groundwork in a, in a positive way for my son so um, that, I, that I just enable him to be whatever he wants, but also kind of maybe warn him of, of potential pitfalls <laughs> if, he's, if he's a bit careless. What um, you know? What conclusion did you come to? How can you do that then? I mean, I do, I'm not you know making. Uh, I don't mean to make light of a obviously an imminent, very big personal thing that's going to happen. You know, you're going to have maybe what? What actually? What did? How did you decide how you could handle it, Alex? Um, yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it's it's partly um an active stance like what am i going to do but at the same time i think my conclusions are more tied to what i'm not going to do um i'm probably not going to try to impose some sort of worldview um or you know just uh, i'm going to try to create very good you know conditions of, of calm and you know a relatively prosperous uh, childhood, you know, in a in a good uh, in a good stable family, and I'm also going to let let my husband take the lead in terms of uh, a lot of things. Something that's probably not uh, you're not going to hear in, in many uh, parenting circles, but I think you know there's no one better to teach a son than a man. Um, and obviously, I'm not referring uh, to his, you know, when he's a baby or a toddler. Then obviously, I'll, I'll be, I'll be more involved, and I'll be, I'll be kind of the, the main, uh, the rock. But once, once it comes to acquiring skills, you know, managing, managing the world, then probably my husband will be the kind of the, the main focus there, and he'll be the one teaching him. Um, it's, it's quite hard not to be the, the devouring mother nowadays, <laughs> and yes. to, uh, to not try to be. Over protective or or controlling or so yeah I think that's going to be my challenge and you know just yeah trying to be because I think he's, uh, a uh, good starting point yeah I think any sort of boy now young kid is going to be faced is he not with being yet another product um, representative of this terrible patriarchy that, that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, he, you know, he's going to have, he's almost going to have original sin on his head, isn't he? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, the idea of, of um, inherent privilege mm. of you, you know, people treating you different just because uh, of, of how you look and, and sy systemic things, nebulous things, dark things. Um, the, the problem with, with this um these arguments is that there you can't disprove them no. you know it's, it's proving a negative it's like okay prove to me that there is no systemic sexism mm. well where do you start and where do you end uh you know anyone who's engaged in debate club knows that proving a negative is going to be very hard and this applies obviously to all sorts of other things systemic or or other so i think we're in a bit of a a stalemate and it's going to be very hard to to win the war of ideas on this one of people that are very entrenched and uh who might benefit from continuing the war um so uh, yeah yeah just i think protecting and and uh setting people setting children up um uh, with a little bit of critical thinking that's probably the only thing you can do and then you know good luck <laughs> we, we wish you well well speaking of which when 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 is your when is your baby due um, at the end of June. End of June. So. <laughs> well, look, all the very best for that, Alex. I, thank you so much. Thank you for, for joining us. I hope maybe you'll join us again when you, uh, you well, maybe next next year when you're a little bit out of the woods, as it were, you know, with the whole thing, uh, and uh, come back and speak to us again. But it's been delightful to talk to you. Thank you so much. It was, it was lovely coming on. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, that's it for this week on So What You're Saying Is. And uh, we shall see you next time. And in the meantime, please don't forget, will you, to subscribe. Thank you very much.